Hi there, hello everyone. I'm the climate guy. You always have to have one, and I'm it today. I'm here today to invite you to pay attention to wild species and natural ecosystems. And in doing so, I hope to communicate something that is of relevance to humans too. Uh, my name is Adam Veltz. I'm a writer, photographer, filmmaker from Cape Town. I'm also a very keen naturalist. No, not a naturist. Naturists are people who like to play tennis in the nude and have picnics and things like that. <laughs> I'm a naturalist. That means I like to learn the names of wild species. I'm constantly looking at them. I like to find out how they fit into ecosystems and things like that. I usually have a pair of binoculars around my neck nowadays. Anyhow, recently I wrote a book. There it is. It's called The End of Eden, Wild Nature in the Age of Climate Breakdown. And I use this term breakdown very deliberately because climate is like a kind of a structure. It's kind of like pattern, a pattern form in space and time. You know, we can make predictions, we can say things about climate like August in New York is hot and humid and Johannesburg in July is cool and dry. And when we start breaking the system, we can't just put it back together again. It's not like, uh, like a building, when you start breaking it down, it just doesn't just stand up by itself if you stop breaking it down. In the same way, things like uh, Arctic ice sheets, once they've melted, even if we stop emitting carbon into the atmosphere and heating things up, they won't just magically reconstitute themselves and freeze again. So climate breakdown, I think, is a very important shift in the way that we can talk about things. Anyhow, back to the book. The media, when it talks about climate, tends to focus almost exclusively on our species, on Homo sapiens. But we share the planet with millions and millions of other species, and they're fascinating, and they're amazing, and they're beautiful. So I thought, let's turn this climate camera around. Let's go and look at, at wild nature and see how climate breakdown is affecting them. Um, the media does sometimes talk about wild species, but usually when it does, it talks about small, irrelevant, faraway stories or big, sort of vague stories that people can't really get a hand on. So what I wanted to do was really start small, start intimate, talk about species and build it big and give my readers an understanding of how climate breakdown actually works in terms of the natural world the different ways that climate breakdown affects wild species. Uh, I want to give you a sense, once you've read the book, that you understand something, that you don't just walk away with sort of vague feeling of sadness that you might feel when you read a lot of other media. Once I started researching the book, I realized very quickly that a lot of very important, very consequential climate impacts are actually quite hard to see especially if you're not a nature nerd like myself. And I'll give you an example of a bird. It's a fascinating creature called the yellow-billed hornbill. It's quite common here in South Africa in certain habitats. It lives, um, you know, in the savannas of the low felt and places like that. And one of the places it has always done really well is the Kalahari, or the, if you prefer, the Kalakadi region of Southern Africa, this dry, sort of arid uh, savanna. Um, and these birds have been living there for you know, thousands and thousands of years, as long as anybody knows, can remember. And if you go there today, if you go to the Kalahari, you will see them flying around with their crazy yellow bills. They're very charismatic. They're very char characterful creatures. They're great to look at. And you might think, oh, everything's fine with the yellow-billed hornbills in the Kalahari. But everything is not fine with the yellow-billed uh, hornbills of the Kalahari. In fact, the yellow-billed hornbills of the Kalahari are the living dead. They're zombies, they're doomed. And we know this through research into alia by some very smart people at the University of Cape Town. And I'll tell you why they're doomed. Yellow-billed hornbills have always had a strategy for dealing with really hot days. And that strategy, it's very evolved, very high-tech strategy, it's called sitting in the shade and doing nothing. Basically, when things get really, really hot for the yellow-billed hornbills, they go and find a shady patch under a bush they, they, to get out of the sun, which adds radiant energy to their body, they stop moving so that their muscles aren't releasing more energy inside their body and heating them up even more. And they open their mouth and they pant to offload heat because they don't have sweat glands like us. It looks something like this. Anyhow, that can get them through a very hot part of the day, and they've done this for ages. 
The problem is the Kalahari is heating up more rapidly than the global average. And uh, 20 years ago, these birds were doing fine. Now, the problem is they're having to spend too much of their day sitting in the shade and doing nothing. And they don't have enough time to find enough food for their babies. Their schedules are being wrecked by climate breakdown. And their babies are either starving in the nest or being born, uh, leaving the nest malnourished and not able to survive very long after that. So if you go to the Kalahari today, you will still see yellow-billed hornbills around, and we will still see them for some years because these birds can live 15, maybe 20 years long. But from 2027 onwards, the prediction is they won't be able to create uh, babies to replace themselves. And we're seeing the same thing happening all around the world. I was in the Mojave Desert. The Mojave Desert in Southern California has lost half of the bird species that bred there 100 years ago are no longer breeding there. Other impacts, though, are a little more obvious. Uh, I'll tell a story of a very small animal, a very big animal, very quickly. In the northeastern United States, there's an animal called the winter tick. It's a little tick, like we know ticks. There's also an animal called a moose, a gigantic big mammal, and that's the most, uh, biggest mammal in that area. What's happening, the winter tick uh, hatches in the early spring, and this animal grows larger and larger through the summer. And in the fall, what it has to do is grab onto a big, furry, warm animal so it can survive the winter. Okay? If it doesn't grab on, if a little winter tick doesn't grab onto a big, furry, warm animal before winter comes, it dies. It dies in the cold. It has to have the heat of a warm animal. And so in the fall, it start, they start crawling to the end of branches and the end of grasses and grabbing onto whichever big animal comes by. And in this case, we're talking about a moose. Now, what's happened again is this area has been warming up rather rapidly over the last 20 years. And what this means is these winter ticks have got a longer, warmer autumn, a longer, warmer fall than they used to have. So there's much more time for them to find a big furry animal to grab onto. And the result is these moose are being uh, colonized by thousands and thousands of ticks. And we get this kind of thing. This is a ghost moose, they call them now. It's missing most of its fur, and a, and a lot of its skin is open because ticks have simply eaten away at them. And the average moose now in Vermont has 47,000 ticks on it. And the ticks are literally exsanguinating them. They're pulling the blood out of these animals to such an extent that the females don't have enough nutrition in them to carry successful pregnancies at the rate that they used to. And so moose are dying off. And it's just because of a little, tiny little increase in temperature towards the end of the fall has liberated these ticks from their previous constraints. Sometimes the impacts of climate breakdown are so overwhelming you can't evade them. In the end of 2019, early 2020, Australia experienced extraordinary bushfires as a result of an unusually strange and incredibly hot summer that was the result of strange climate patterns that are the result of climate breakdown. And I went there. And I went to a place called Kosciuszko National Park, which is not too far from Sydney, and I pulled my car over to the side of the road. And all around me were literally hundreds of thousands of hectares of burnt forest. And I'm not scared of fire. I'm a trained ecologist. I know that many ecosystems around the world are fire-driven. Fire is a natural part of these ecosystems. I've seen loads of fires. But this is the scene that finally broke down my psychological barriers to really accepting what climate breakdown really means. I'd known about it for years. I'd studied it for years. But when you see a landscape not just burned to this extent, but burned as thoroughly as it is burned, all around you like that, it, I suddenly realized I was seeing the future. I was seeing something completely unknown. I felt like a man on the moon. I was seeing something that these trees had never seen before. Because these are trees that are adapted to survive fire, and yet this fire had killed a whole lot of them. They'd never, they couldn't do it anymore because we're pushing them into a brand new world. The rock outcrops had all shattered because the fire was so hot it broke the rock. So sometimes 
This really makes me think, I've heard this term global weirding, and I thought, that's actually what this is. Because we can talk about the predictions of climate and what we think will happen and all of this, but actually, we're moving into an era where we don't understand things anymore. We're moving into an era of deep uncertainty, deep instability. And that's something really worth thinking about. And as I was writing the book, I thought, you know, it's funny. The more influence we have on the biosphere, on the atmosphere of all the ecosystems of the world, the less control we have over them. Because the more carbon we throw into the air, the more pollution we throw into the air, the more we destabilize the climate, because it is such a complex system, the less we can predict what it's going to do. And so, in addition to inflicting heating on ourselves, we're inflicting extraordinary uncertainty on ourselves, not only on ourselves, on the millions of other species that share the planet with us. So anyway, this talk is supposed to be about solutions and actions as well. And so I can tell you one of the better solutions I've found to the psychological impact of trying to deal, deal with this is cheap antidepressants. I can recommend them 100%. Without them, I would not have finished the book. Um, and I think we also need to think about economies and decarbonization a lot more deeply than most people do. Because people talk, oh, we've got to move away from oil and fossil fuels and all drive electric cars and so on. We need to go much, much, much deeper than that. We need to acknowledge that our global economy, the economies we've built, are in very simple but very true terms concerned with turning nature into things that are briefly useful to us and then into trash and pollution. That's what we've built our entire societies to do. And this is called economic growth. And all the smart people tell us we need to do more and more and more and more economic growth ever faster, all the time. And this is nuts. This is just suicidal. And I'm, I've seen it with my own eyes. I, I come from afar, friends, to tell you that this is true. <laughs> you know, global finance is demanding the impossible, actually. We've built a global financial system that wants to, us to do impossible things. And it's insane. It's actually manifestly insane. So we've got to do, we've got to create real circular economies. The, never mind all the creatures. Social justice demands that we create genuine social, you know, circular economies. And we must develop our thinking about the unknown, because that's where we're going. We're going into the deep unknown. And that's a very weird and very, very difficult to thing to think about. We've basically got to change everything about our civilizations. But the flip side, the positive thing of that is if you have to change everything, that means everybody's got something to do. So there are no excuses anymore, and it's actually quite lacquer if you think about it. You know? But we've got to consider the needs of wild species when we do this, because another thing that struck me is that there are two key challenges to life. Life has two key challenges, survival and reproduction. And every single different species out there is a successful answer to those two questions of survival and reproduction. Every fish, every bug, every plant, every everything, they're all a winning answer to those two questions. And as we move ever deeper into uncertainty, we need options. We need more options. We need more answers. So if your climate solution means that you're pushing species into extinction, if your climate solution means that you're further destabilizing natural ecosystems, which many of them are, it's not a climate solution at all. I want to just end with one or two examples of really silly things, like this mania for tree planting. I don't know if you've noticed this, but everybody <laughs> thinks that planting trees is like the most incredible thing. And, and so nowadays we have companies and corporations and governments and who else, they're all planting trees like it's going out of fashion. So we have million tree projects, billion tree projects, trillion tree projects now. And we have people trying to plant more trees in 24 hours than the next guy and it's tree planting, is, it's just gone completely out of control. 
And they're planting trees in people's villages and forcing them off their land. They're planting trees in people's croplands and forcing them off their land. They're planting the wrong trees in the wrong places so they all die. And the climate benefits of this are very, very debatable. You know? And another thing is corn ethanol, turning millies, turning corn into liquid fuel for vehicles. An ungodly percentage of America's corn crop gets turned into liquid fuel for vehicles. Again, with almost no climate benefit. It's insane. It takes up millions of acres of land. It causes incredible agrochemical pollution. But this is a climate solution. Really? So I just encourage you to stop and think and sit with this climate problem, no matter how painful it is. It's incredibly painful. It's incredibly difficult. Before charging off into solution mode, because, again, I'll say it, if your climate solution is pushing more species into extinction and destroying more natural ecosystems, it's no climate solution at all. Thank you very much.